All right, take it away. Well, hi, uh, I'm Rich Norby. I'm uh, associated, been associated with the uh, Ecology and Evolutionary Biology Department for quite a while. I retired from the Oak Ridge National Lab about four years ago where I spent my career. And I've recently uh, had an, started an association with the University of Birmingham in the UK, which is especially relevant for this talk. So I wanted to share some, some of the quantitative aspects of the free air CO2 or face experiment uh, that I've been involved in. And it's sort of a narrow topic of adjusting for the pretreatment bias, but it's been really important for the overall analysis of the experiment. Um, the face experiment that I'm talking about is the BIFOR or Birmingham Institute of Forest Research experiment, which is located in central England. It's in a old oak stand, 180 year old uh, English oak uh, with hardware understory. The, the forest is fairly similar to our deciduous forest of East Tennessee, except it's not nearly as diverse. Uh, see uh, how high the forest is. And we set up 30 meter, approximately 30 meter diameter plots, uh, three of them in ambient CO2 and three in elevated CO2. And I don't know if you're familiar with how face experiments work, but these black vent pipes here are used to release uh, uh, enriched CO2 into the forest and then the wind distributes it to maintain the set concentration. So it's essentially, uh, you're avoiding any artifacts of chambers and it's essentially a, uh, well, that's why it's called free air CO2 enrichment experiment. So the experiment started in 2017. I got involved uh, a little bit after that. Um, and everything I'm talking about today is in this paper that we just got published uh, several months ago. I'm only going to be talking about a little as a small aspect of this, but you know, if you're interested in seeing more of the the background of the experiment and the broader concepts and everything, uh, please check out this paper. Uh, objective of uh, what I'll be talking about now is basically to quantify the effect of CO2 enrichment on above ground woody biomass production. We also looked at NPP, net primary productivity, but I won't be talking about that today. And my approach started with what we'd used in the face experiment we ran in at ORNL uh, in a sweet gum stand shown here um, from 1997 to 2010. That's where I basically got all my experience with this. The approach is to lay out experimental plots um, with uh, hopefully equal basal areas, a lot of measurements to optimize the positioning of the plots. And you measure the circumference of all the trees. There's about 90 trees per plot and do that monthly. Convert biomass and um, convert the diameter measurements to biomass and dry matter increment using allometric equations. And then sum over all the trees and divide by plot area. Pretty basic approach. The BIFOR experiment, though, is a lot more complex than this uniform plantation at the ORNL face, and the methods had to be altered uh, because of that, uh, creating a lot of difficulties and um, a lot of, and that's what I'll be talking about now. There's a lot fewer trees, only five per, or seven per plot, but they have much, much larger canopies. There's really high spatial variability. Relative growth is much slower, making um, harder to detect responses. And the plot boundaries were irregular, which also created some difficulties in the quantification. The first look we had uh, at the data uh, with the elevated ones in green here showed uh, increased growth in the uh, elevated CO2 plots. Um, starting in 2017, you can see the average response is 29%. That's pretty impressive um, and suggests perhaps a response to elevated CO2, but can you really say that difference is due to the elevated CO2 or just differences uh, pre differences that have always been there across the plots because of different nutrition or something else? So we really need to know what growth would have been in the elevated arrays without the addition of CO2. Well, the first look at that, we do have some data from 2016, and look, there you can see there was a similar response or even larger in the 2016, the pretreatment year, uh, that would suggest that the subsequent responses were not a response to CO2. One way to look at that is just sort of relativize all of these responses to, so that they're equal in 2016. And now you see there's apparently a negative response to elevated CO2. 
Uh, the problem with this, however, is that the oak data that we have from 2016 are very unreliable. Um, they're actually done by a um, um, Earth Watch group with you know bankers and like having ecology field days for fun, and they're the ones making the measurement. And no one was really looking at the data for several years till I got involved, and there was a lot of problems with it. Um, a lot of the trees weren't measured till uh, halfway through the growing season. Tried to adjust annual growth based on the percentage that was missing based on subsequent years. Also, four trees weren't measured at all, so I had to adjust the array total for that fractional contribution. In other words, there's a lot of sort of hand-waving to adjust the data, which is never very uh, satisfying. It's always a little bit um, scary when you can manipulate the data to such an extent by changing some assumptions. Well, another approach was to use uh, initial uh, leaf area index uh, to relativize, and that's this approach that's has been used at the uh, similar experiment in a eucalyptus uh, uh, forest in Australia. It's so-called uke face experiment. They used uh, pretreatment LAI to relativize subsequent growth. I tried the same thing. And the trouble is that dry matter increment was only weakly, weakly related to LAI. So it really shouldn't be considered a very good surrogate for subsequent growth. Well, given these problems and also recognizing that a single year of pretreatment probably isn't the best approach, we decided to use a tree ring analysis uh, instead. Um, the, um, I'm working with Neil Loader, at, uh, who's a tree ring dendrochronologist at uh, Swansea University, cored all the trees, um, did the whole ring with series. This is the graphs at the top are from an individual tree. Actually, we took the quantify the rings all the way back to 150 years or so, but just some recent years, you see the ring width from an absolute measure of diameter you can, and correction for bark, you can get the tree diameter and then calculate basal area increment, which is what's shown here for every tree in the um, in the plots. The orange now is elevated CO2. I, I always use green for elevated CO2 the whole time I was at or in L, but the Birmingham people use orange, so I had to convert my, <laughs> my graphs accordingly. But uh, what you could see from this graph is that there's really high both temporal variability and tree-to-tree -tree variability. So how are you going to detect a response to CO2 subsequent to 2017 from this sort of mess of data? And also, I think it really emphasizes why one year of pretreatment data would be insufficient to characterize it. So the approach we took was to um, well, first of all, com, uh, convert the, uh, uh, calculate a biomass increment from the uh, diameters using allometric equations. And I'm going to, at the end of the talk here, if I have time, I'll say a little bit more about the allometry, which is, I think, a pretty interesting topic and another strongly quantitative aspect of this. But anyway, we get the uh, total biomass increment per plot divided by plot area, and then took the average dry matter increment over these pretreatment years of 2011 to 2015, not including the immediate pretreatment year of 2016, and then use that average as a relative adjustment factor. That is the pretreatment plot average divided by the overall average. Uh, that adjustment factor ranged from 0.68 to 1.56. So all the subsequent um, measurements based on um, dendro uh, measurements from dendro bands, as you see on the picture on the right, uh, were uh, converted to uh, dry matter and relativized based on this adjustment factor. And this resulted in the graph that is basically the central graph in this paper I uh, just just had published. And this was this is my best estimate of the response here to uh, CO two after accounting for the pretreatment differences. See that the there's a 9.8% average annual increase, significantly different through repeated measures analysis, although any individual year is not significant. You notice the loss of response in 2019, which we uh, associate with a uh, insect outbreak, and there's some data to back that up, that that was uh, the reason. We also calculated net primary productivity, including fine root production, leaf production, so on, for two years. That increased by 10.6%, and that's another really essential product here, but I'm not going to talk about that. It's 
uh, a lot that went into that. But the conclusion we drew uh, in the paper from this presentation is that the results refute the notion that many people had suggested that mature forests cannot respond to elevated CO2. All of the previous work was with younger, faster growing plantations. A lot of people suggested mature forests, such as the Uke forest, Uke face experiment in Australia, would not respond to elevated CO2. So these results um, uh, refute that, and therefore they can substantiate a major role for mature temperate forests in climate change mitigation. Now, I mentioned allometry, and I guess I have a little bit of time to talk about this. You know, carbon accrual in forests is, besides in these experiments like the one I'm talking about, it's also a key metric for assessments of national carbon accounting, as well as these forest responses to global change. But, you know, direct measurement of increases in tree biomass is usually impossible. And you can't cut down the forest to measure it and then say, you know, often. So the estimates of tree biomass and biomass increment therefore depend on allometric relationships between tree mass or tree volume and other easily assessed non-destructive measurements, which is probably is going to include tree diameter and, and often height. Uh, most experiments and other kinds of analyses, we, plot, we uh, rely on published equations based on a forest harvest someplace. You see the form of the equation that you usually have here, um, and it might, might include tree height as well. For the BIFOR experiment, uh, well, ideally you want it for the species of interest uh, and include a large range of tree size. I'll tell you, doing the same thing in the Amazon, there's a face experiment developed in the Amazon forest and well, every tree there is a different species. So that's a whole different problem. But anyway, in by four, we just have to worry about one species. Um, and there are indeed published equations uh, that give based on a comprehensive analysis. And um, that's what we relied on at first. Um, it's for the species of interest and it was data from Northwest Spain. Uh, I started having a little bit of doubt about the that experiment after hearing some discussions of, from Kim Calders and uh, and um, who's a expert in this area and um, and others. <laughs> excuse me, um, casting some doubt on the allometry that's been used. So instead, I looked at data that he supplied me from Wytham Woods. Wytham Woods is the uh, Oxford University forest, so it's not very far from the Bifor forest. It's a mixed species, but they have a lot of English oak in there and develop a decent allometry um, based on those data. You assume a specific wood specific gravity and um, that could be used for predict predicting trees in the Bifor experiment. Even better, the smaller graph on the, on the left if you include height in the equation. But at the time I didn't have height data from uh, Bifor. <laughs> well, um, here's the problem with all these different um, allometry equations. The orange dots here are predictions of the by four trees using the Forrester, published Forrester equations that I started with. The arrow shows the largest tree in the Forrester database used to establish the allometry. You see like half the trees in by four are larger than the trees in the calibration set. Well, that sort of violates a lot of basic rules and approaches for doing this sort of thing. The blue points are, I'm told is what is frequently used in across the UK for carbon forest carbon assessments. I didn't use it at all in BIFOR, but you see re really, really different response. <clears throat> and then the green ones are the, the equation I just showed previous slide from Wytham Woods. And this is good because the largest tree in that data set is larger than the um, trees in Bifor. But you see, there's really big differences in uh, biomass predictions, especially in the large trees. And it also affected the relative response to CO2. Well, as we're developing this and worrying about which ones to use, uh, a we had a complete terrestrial laser scan of all the trees in, in BIFOR, which gives a pretty robust estimate of tree volume for each tree. You can, you know the um, wood 
specific gravity so you can get biomass of each tree and regress it across diameter. And that's the red dots, which you see are very, very similar to the uh, Forster equations we started with, which is sort of neat. It came after all this worrying about different equations, it came to basically where we started, but it's not identical. And you see the deviations are a little bit different at the highest trees, and it does affect the relative CO2 response. So there's a lot more I could say about the uh, allometry and all. It's a pretty fascinating subject, I think, that is often ignored in a lot of these carbon assessments you read about. <clears throat> well, let me conclude here. At, at the basic point is that detecting responses to elevated CO2 in a mature forest is a really pretty tough challenge. The size and the heterogeneity of the site make quantification uh, and detection of CO2 response challenging. Accounting for the pretreatment differences, as I discussed, is critical for detecting response to CO2 and having confidence in that prediction as well. The tree ring analysis was really critical in doing, in doing that. It gave me the confidence that we were doing it in an unbiased way. The results are also very dependent on allometric equations. But, you know, a longer time series of all these components will increase confidence in the results. So I will stop there and happy to answer any questions.